Hearing impairments, abbreviated as HI. Subscribe, like, and share to receive notifications of new videos. This video will cover the definition, characteristics, identification, causes, prevalence, educational consideration, and transition for hearing impairments. Let's start with the definition. There are two categories of definitions for hearing impairments. The first category is physiological. A person is defined as deaf when they are unable to hear sounds 90 decibels or greater, and hard of hearing when sounds below 90 decibels cannot be heard. The second category is educational. A person in the educational category of hearing impairments is said to be deaf when they are unable to process linguistic information through hearing with or without a hearing aid, and said to be hard of hearing when the use of a hearing aid allows access to linguistic information. So what is a decibel? Decibels address the volume or loudness of sound, while frequency addresses the pitch or intensity of sound, such as a low voice or a squeaky voice. Looking at the characteristics. The green area of this chart shows a normal range of hearing in decibels, approximately negative 20 to 26 decibels. Notice in this area, a person should be able to hear birds chirping, rustling leaves, water dripping from a sink faucet, and other related sounds. The light blue area of this chart shows mild hearing loss. A person in this range may be able to hear a loud whistle depending on their ability to hear frequencies, but would not be able to hear the items above in green. The yellow area represents moderate hearing loss. A person may be able to hear a radio being played, but would not be able to hear the items above in green or light blue. The orange area shows severe hearing loss. A person in this area may be able to hear a lawnmower, dogs barking, a piano being played, or a telephone ringing, but they would not be able to hear the items above in green, light blue, or yellow. Finally, the pink section represents profound hearing loss. A person in this area may be able to hear an 18-wheeler truck, loud singing at a concert, a chainsaw, a helicopter flying overhead, or the sound of a plane engine, but they would not be able to hear any of the above items in the other colors. A person with normal hearing would be able to hear all of the colors on this chart. Now notice in the middle of the chart, you'll see a shape that looks like a banana. This area of the hearing chart shows the level of hearing needed for most language communication. Notice the majority of letters and sounds are between 30 and 60 decibels. So a person with a mild hearing loss may be able to pick up most words in communication depending on their ability to hear various frequencies. While a person with a severe or profound hearing loss most likely will not be able to hear the conversation. In summary, you can see the decibel ranges of hearing impairment on the right. Here is an illustration of the outer, middle, and inner ear. The outer ear is the cartilage we see and the eardrum where wax collects. The eardrum funnels sounds received from the outside world to the middle ear. The middle ear is further inside and includes three tiny bones that vibrate from the funneled sounds and send the vibrations to the inner ear. The inner ear has a snail shell looking part called the cochlea that vibrates sounds to the vestibular nerve for auditory processing in the brain. A few warning signs to look for regarding hearing impairments include a child not developing sounds appropriately, frequent or reoccurring ear infections, difficulties listening, delayed language skills, 
poor performance at school, a child or person may not respond to loud or sudden noises, and poor communication due to middle ear issues. A few of the common difficulties associated with hearing impairments include language or speech delays and disorders, sensory processing issues, difficulties with attention and listening, behavioral difficulties, gross motor difficulties, and difficulties with reading and spelling. Let's look at how we can identify hearing impairments. Hearing impairments are often identified through screening tests with autoacoustic emissions. You may remember taking one of these tests when you were in school. You would have on headphones and a little button in your hand, and the assessor would ask you to press the button anytime you heard a sound. The sound may be low, such as boop, or it could be higher, such as boop. So this test is looking at the decibels, meaning the volume, and it may also be looking at frequency or pitch. So some sounds may be higher, like beep, while others may be lower, such as boop. There's also the pure tone audiometry. audiometry. With a pure tone audiometry, they're looking at different frequencies. So not only do we need to know the decibels or the volume a person is able to hear, but we also need to know the varying levels of pitch. And finally, there's also speech audiometry. With speech audiometry, the speech recognition threshold is assessed. With SRT, the decibel level required to achieve 50% of the words correctly is identified. And it's recommended that assessors use the same bracketing from the pure tone audiometry. When identifying a hearing impairment, we also need to classify the different areas of the impairment. When classifying a hearing impairment, we need to look at the type, severity, and onset. For the different types, there's sensorineural, which means problems of the, neural, of the nervous system in the inner ear. There's also conductive, meaning there's a blockage or interference of sound in the inner ear. Finally, there's central deafness, which is damage to the hearing centers in the brain, and this is actually quite rare. When looking at severity, there's mild, moderate, severe, and profound. In terms of onset, congenital means the person was born deaf. Adventitious means the person acquired deafness sometime after birth. Prelingual means the hearing impairment occurred at birth or before speech and language developed. And postlingual means the hearing impairment occurred after the development of speech. Time for the causes. Possible causes of hearing impairments include hereditary or genetic factors, illness to the mother while pregnant, such as if she gets measles, premature birth, illness to the baby, again it could be measles or meningitis, there could have been an accident, and there's also the possibility of side effects from medications. If we get a little more specific, we can look at the different parts of the ear that can cause hearing impairments. Looking at the outer ear, acute infections such as external otitis or an underdeveloped ear canal could result in a hearing impairment. Moving on to the middle ear, there's otitis media, which is another form of an acute infection. And for the inner ear, this is where you can have hereditary or genetic issues, as well as congenital cytal mm, CMV virus. In the world have a hearing impairment? Hmm. According to the World Health Organization, approximately 5% of the world population has a hearing impairment. Of those 5%, approximately 93% are adults and 7% are children. 60% of cases are from preventable causes. our students who may have hearing impairments. Let's look at a few educational considerations. Let's start with a few strategies. You could use a multi-sensory approach. You could model the tasks for the students. 
You can use tactile activities. Make sure to use simple and concise information. You can always use visual aids. There's speech therapy and alternative forms of communication, such as sign language, picture exchange communication, and voice output devices, such as the FM radio. Look at a few accommodations for students with hearing impairments. You could use sign language interpretation, speech to text and captioning on videos, assistive technology, oral transliteration, extra time, a quiet room for assessment, and of course repeated review, we could also determine the best seat for the student in the classroom. We can reduce distractions, check for understanding, allow frequent breaks. We can always provide a hard copy of notes or a note taker in class, and try to use step-by-step -step directions. Now notice accommodations do not change the criteria of the assignment, but they do help with the presentation. Moving on to modifications for students with hearing impairments, we could shorten the assignment length, pre-teach vocabulary, reduce the workload, provide alternative tests, or provide reading assistance. Let's move on to transition. We want to be sure to prepare our students for adulthood. Whether they have a hearing impairment or not, students need to be prepared for employment. They need to know how to fill out job applications. They also need to have an idea of what interests them. Where would they like to work? We can also look at continuing education or training. Perhaps they want to start a vocational career and we need to help them find programs suitable to their needs. There's also the area of living independently. We may need to help the students know how to use public transportation or how to cook and clean in the house. There's also access to work. We can look for programs that help students with disabilities with employment, and we can also help students with employment skills. And of course, there's higher education. If the students desire to go to university, we need to help them with college applications and make sure they know about that college's disability center so that they can document their hearing impairment to receive appropriate accommodations. 